Flicker to get the night started. Downfield looking for Godwin. Into his hands. Scored a touchdown earlier on a direct snap. Now it's Michelle's turn running all the way. Gets to the edge. Tony Michelle will send the dogs home to the championship game. And Bobo throws that thing in the end zone and yes! it's touchdown! Touchdown in the goal line! Cambiando estaba Felix Lee. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? This is Robert Iron E. Singleton, a.k.a. d Dunn from The Walking Dead or Alton from The Blind Side. Also, the former DB turned running back for the University of Georgia. And you are watching Respect the Hedges on the Fan Attic Sports Network. All right, guys. Go dogs. Sick <laughs> Welcome here, RTH family. It's your boy, Coach I. We're back for another episode of Football 101. This is part two of four. And at Respect the Hedges, you know we're always sponsored by the Tailgate Kings. That's right, we're back for part two of Football 101, being a better fan. Last week, we brought you rules and turns. We had a special guest referee, our guy, Julius Milton, Georgia alum. And listen, man, he brought the knowledge. So today, we're going to further on the conversation. We're going to talk about offense, all things offense. And we got our same panel from last week with another guy. So we're going to bring up my girl, Shelby, first. What's going on, Shelby? Hey, bad to be back. So Hina had her prop last week. So I brought my prop, which, of course, I... is a bottle holder. <laughs> because it's if the Georgia dogs don't know nothing, we know how to drink. That's right. <laughs> Listen, it's what we do. <laughs> it's what we do. Let's bring on our second co-host. We're talking about former trainer at UGA and another unsaid school and a physical therapist and her one of her sons is on the UGA equipment staff we're talking about Hina Patel what's going on Hina hi RTH family hi everybody Shelby I'm loving that shirt and that heel oh yeah <laughs> I was like I think I need one of those <laughs> we I all know, do right that's yeah. right. That's right. And since we're talking about offense, we got to bring in one of my co-hosts from the Respect the Hedges show. We're talking all things offense today. And in Georgia, the offense starts with the tight end. So let's go ahead and bring him in, Mr. Javaris Johnson. What's going on, JV? Hey, man, I'm so glad that you went on ahead and got that put into the show early, that all things offense run through the tight end position. Uh, hey, listen, I'm glad to be here, guys. Um, let me just start off by saying this. Last week, I wasn't able to be here, but I watched the show. You guys did a tremendous job. So proud of you guys. And I'm just looking to um, kind of come in here and fill in where I can, man. I feel like uh, one of the – I feel like a guest uh, on a panel of experts. <laughs> Great job last week. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. So we talking all things offense. This is going to be spearheaded by Shelby and JV with me and Hina here as backups. So we're going to let them bring it to y'all how they want to bring it to y'all. How y'all want to start this thing off today, Shelby? I think JV is going to start and explain what offense is. Let's let's is. talk about, I mean, because some people don't know. We can tell that by some of your comments on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> Sound like a good starting point to me. JV, take it away, my brother. So, guys, listen, we are here today to talk about offense. Um, I think a lot of people know that, uh, on a football team, you have an offensive team, and you have a defensive team, but you have some people who might be a little bit confused about some of the nuances of offense, some of the positions. And realistically, 
why the offense is on the field and what their objective is. So that's what we're going to explain to you guys today. Um, <clears throat> essentially, the offense has a lot of different responsibilities. But the main, re the main responsibility, of course, is to score points. We yeah. need to score points in order to win a game. You can't win a game zero to zero. So with that being the case, offensive, the offensive team goes on, um, steps onto the field to try to score points. And those points can consist of a touchdown, which is six points. A lot of people will say seven, but it's only six. An extra point is one. Or they'll try to tip a field goal, which is three points. In certain situations where we score a touchdown, we can either go for the single point, like I just had mentioned, the extra point field goal, or we can go for a two-point conversion. We won't muddy the waters with you guys if you don't really know the aspects of scoring points and, 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 and continue on talking about the two-point conversion, but just know that's an option for the offense as well. Um, one of the main objectives that uh, one of the other main objectives that the offense does when he's on the field is they try to hold the ball. They try to gain time of possession. And why is that time of possession key? Because it allows our defense to rest and to go out and dominate like we have the past two years, um, as evidenced from the back-to-back -back championships and the, the uh, top-tier defense that we put on the field. But we're here talking offense. This is the, those were the responsibilities of the offense. And I'm going to turn it back over to my girl, Shelby to move into what the offense and and the uh, and the uh, positions are for the offensive team. And before Shelby jumps in, if y'all got questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. So uh, anything offense that you want to know from what position it is, like JV said, how many points can be scored in a certain situation, why coaches go for it sometimes and sometimes not. We might be able to answer your questions, but get them in the comments tonight. Go ahead, Shelby. So I'm going to start first with the huddle. The huddle is just when all the players talk about what they're going to do. They call the play. And then I'm going to go into my one of my favorite positions, the quarterback, because the quarterback gives you the play. That's his job. He can throw the ball. He can run the ball. Again, probably not as well as Stetson Bennett did against Auburn. Um, if you look back at 2021 and 2022, he had two runs. Uh, anyway, we don't have to talk about that. We don't have to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but he, you can know the quarterback can run. Um, fun fact about Stetson Bennett, I don't think y'all know this. Did y'all know Stetson Bennett? actually completed 70% of his passes last year, whereas Caleb yes, he... <laughs> Williams, Heisman Trophy winner, only completed 66% of his passes. I'm not saying anything about the Heisman. I'm just saying those are the facts. That's all I'm saying. Um, bringing those dimes. Keep on bringing those dimes. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, these are just facts. These are, you know, they're readily available on Google. Heisman facts. <laughs> Heisman uh, voters. These are these are just facts. Um, but the quarterback is so instrumental. I hate it when people call Stetson Bennett a game manager because that's kind of disrespectful to what he did. He was not a game manager. The game flowed through him, and that's what a good quarterback does. The game flows through him. He sets the tone for the offense, and that's why you know we had to put a picture of Stetson Bennett, not only because he won two championships at the University of Georgia, but because he's a great quarterback, and I'm excited to see if he lands in the NFL somewhere. I think he will, and that's a good explanation on the game manager, Shelby. Good job. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Right. Indeed. <laughs> so JB, what let, you got? Let's jump over to these running backs. So – of course, University of Georgia is known as many things, right? We're becoming linebacker you. We're definitely tight end you. Thanks. But traditionally, we've always been known as running back you, as evidenced from some of the greatest backs that have been able to grace the college uh, football field, like a Herschel Walker or a Garrison Hurst, Todd Gurley, Nick Chubb. I mean, we can continue to name guys, but the running back um, – over the years has kind of lost and seemed to have lost some of this luster. Why? Because of the, the nuanced offenses that people are running. But here at the University of Georgia, we still put athletes in that position, the running back position, 
on the field that produce at a very high level. So running backs traditionally, guys, if you're talking about a traditional offense, they will take a handoff from the quarterback and run the ball either outside or inside. Um, one of the other nuances of a running back position is they can catch out of the backfield. And that has kind of opened up the position to a whole different um, mm -hmm. method of attack on the defenses. We've had some tremendous guys in the backfield that have done a great job. And namely, the most recent one, Kenny McIntosh, was a tremendous talent. Number, geez, what was, it, what was his number? Number six? Six. Number mm -hmm. six, yes. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard. Number to six. Number six on the field and in your hearts could catch the ball out of the backfield with no problem. But one thing that people don't pay a lot of attention to if you aren't just a real diehard football person is the ability and the requirement for a running back to be as good of a blocker as he is a runner or a pass catcher out of the backfield. He has to be able to fill those gaps and block those blitzes, block those linebackers when they're blitzing, coming after the quarterback, he has to be able to make split second decisions because a lot of times he may know the man that he has to block, but sometimes the play call doesn't afford him the time to be able to go through play fakes and what have you. So they have to be great athletes. They have to be smart. They have to be athletic, strong, fast. Running backs, they are definitely important to the offense. Don't let any of what you hear out here in the media where, where they say running backs aren't as important anymore. Running backs are detrimental still to the offense. Not as detrimental as the tight end, but they are still detrimental <laughs> to the offense. I'm going to keep on plugging this tight end thing, man, because we've been waiting <laughs> on it for too many decades. So, um, But no, seriously, a running back, tremendous talents on our team. They have their tremendous talents. And for the, for the lack of not being able to um, put them on the field all the time um, in – traditional sets like what you see here lining up in the eye back you don't really see a lot of teams that run a traditional set like this anymore you'll see a running back not only line up behind the quarterback on the side of the quarterback split out like a wide receiver um and also up in the line somewhat like a halfback -back. that's right and like this formation shows just to add on to what jv has already uh uh excellently explained uh, this fb is fullback under mark rick we did actually run some I like he said we don't do that anymore, but that would that would be the people like JT Wall. Uh I think the guy's name was Hicks. We called him the Hulk, mm -hmm. number 48. So just for those that's looking at the picture wondering what FB is in front of the running back, he's another type of running back, but we don't really use that guy in our formation. Not a lot of people like JV said use that fullback anymore. Can I ask a quick yeah, question? Yeah, just one more thing. Oh, go, sorry. go ahead. No, um, go ahead, please. Maybe if you'll explain why you have this diagram up, the difference between I formation and T formation. All right. So I formation is what you have here on the screen. You have a quarterback that's lined up under the center. You have a FB, a fullback that lines up directly behind the quarterback, about three to four yards um, behind the quarterback. Mm -hmm. And then you have the tailback running back that lines up behind the fullback, and he's at about, you know, six to six to seven yards um, behind the line of scrimmage. And a lot of times teams would run this formation because they felt like it gave the running back a good visual on holes to hit. It gave them a, um, an additional blocker directly in front of him that he can cut off of. And, again, it was the traditional base pro-style formation that, we had or that football teams had run over the history of the game. Um, a T formation is essentially when you have split backs. Um, you can have several different varieties of the T, but essentially if you have the fullback, he would line up on, let's say, for instance, the left-hand side of the quarterback. Then you would have the running back who would line up on the right-hand side of the quarterback. Both of them would be – essentially about five to six yards behind the quarterback, but they would uh, somewhat form the formation and it would look like a T as opposed to an I like what you see right here. Still a very formidable offense, still a very um, run-centric offense. It allowed them to be able to do a lot of different things. And Georgia, what I, um, I started seeing Georgia do um, early in the 90s was to put two tailbacks or two running backs 
in this set instead of running a fullback and a running back, you would have two running mm-hmm. backs because then you wouldn't be able to focus on which back was getting the ball. And you can mm-hmm. set two backs out into the uh, pass, into the into the pass route without having to denote or limit their um, their alignment. So it gave them a, a little bit better of an alignment on the linebackers that were responsible for covering them. So in short, our back is what you see here. Split, you would have a similar formation, just the running backs will be split to the left, one to the left and one to the right of the running back, four to five yards behind the quarterback. Thank you. Also, another part um, on to your question, Hina, most of the high schools run yep. that T offense. They call it the wing T. If you go to a high school game, especially mm-hmm. in APS, Atlanta Public Schools, all of the high schools run the wing T. That's all yep. they run. And they call it the wing T because, like JV said, they got the T formation in the backfield, but the wing comes when the wide – so there's two wide receivers in this diagram – they would take mm-hmm. that wide receiver and it would normally be a running back, but it could be a wide receiver. He would line up right behind one of the tackles on over to the side. So it's like a wing and they call it a wing T. So now the quarterback has like three different options. He could do, you know, he could reverse it to the wide, the wide receiver running back or he could give it to one of the tailbacks. Thank Which you. is a different offense. The wing T is a different offense from the just a traditional like T offense. So yep. like Isaiah said, you know, if you got the receivers in there, they can have the T back there. Um, and normally they were running with just one receiver, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, right, coach? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, matter of fact, uh, uh, Georgia Tech used to do something similar. Uh, I mean, they, I know they called it the option, but a lot of times uh, they yeah. used to do something kind of similar to that, where we used to always get the cut blocks that that Julius explained uh, <laughs> last last year. Yeah. I mean, last week, and uh, but like JB said, it's just. Like you say, it's just the T in the backfield. And then in high school, they'll put a little guy on the side uh, right behind one of the tackles and call it the wing T. Got it. Gotcha. All right. On to the – hey, man. This, hey, that's – I'm, Listen, I'm liking some of these explanations. I'm like to start explaining this to some of my friends like this. <laughs> so – All right. Uh, the, the next Tell one I'm going to talk about – Yeah, I'm going to talk about the wide receiver because, of course, I can't talk about the tight end. Because I think we know what would happen if I talked about the tight end and not JV. So I'm going to take the wide receiver because, you know, tight ends, we could be here all night about tight ends. Right. So we've got a lot of different talents. See? I'll get to that. See what I tell y'all. So the wide receiver, his job is not just to catch the ball. I mean, that's kind of the easy answer. Oh, he catches the ball. But he does a lot more than that. He also blocks. Um, If you watch some film or if you want if you see a wide receiver especially a number 80 and they're not and it's a run play you'll see them actually block and you can see them get some good blocks uh, on p on the defense uh, but so their job is not just to catch the ball that's their number one job now if you follow me on social media let me be clear yes i have said that about julio jones we pay you to catch the ball i have said that <laughs> i've said that many times and i I don't apologize for it because we paid him a lot of money. Okay, but this is college. It's a whole different thing. Um, so on the picture, we put AJ, AJ Green because he's retiring. When we were getting ready for this, um, AJ Green announced he was retiring. And I thought, what better way to give him his flowers than to include him on our slide? Um, one of the greatest Georgia receivers. Um, had there been an NIL deal back then, he would not have missed as many games for signing yes. a jersey. Uh, but it was not. Back then it was illegal. We'll talk about that in episode four. But, uh, again, a great receiver. So I'm glad to see him retiring on his own terms, not that he gets knocked out of a game and can't play anymore, but he's going out on his own terms. And um, we're excited to see what his next chapter is. Let me just uh, throw a few few other nuances in on the wide receiver position, if you guys don't mind. Um, as Shelby said, it's, it, it's ultra important for the receivers to handle their main responsibilities, which is catching and blocking. Um, and that run game for these running backs, uh, it, they're pivotal. And Kirby, I'll say this, Kirby is a guy that puts a lot of emphasis on that. Um, yes. You'll see, though, here in the in the I form, you have two receivers on the outside. Um 
if you see two receivers line up on the same side, guess what? There's still two receivers. You can see a receiver go in motion um, now in the backfield. You can see a guy uh, go in motion out of the backfield. Um, and you see a lot of different body types. So you have some receivers that are big as tight ends. You have some some receivers that are small and diminutive, um, but quick and fast. So, you know, there really isn't a, a – a, there really isn't anything, any way that you can pencil in um, what a receiver is supposed to look like or really how fast a receiver is supposed to be. But those two main um, responsibilities that they have that shall be explained, man, we have had some great guys. I just want to make sure I give a shout-out real quick. We do have um, A.J. Green up on the screen, but our pre- one of our previous special guests, Terrence Edwards, man, was, if not the best, the second best receiver Absolutely. ever at the University of Georgia. He did his thing. So I always, always and he still holds the game. record. He still numbers, holds the record. He does. Numbers don't lie. That's right. Numbers don't that lie. That he does. <laughs> All right. And uh, like what JB was saying, this is the traditional eye formation. Uh, in most modern offenses, you will see three receivers out there most times and no FB or fullback. So... Mm-hmm. All right, man, let's move it on along All right, to JV. the position Y'all. that t- JV once played at the University of Georgia and loves to boast about. Yes, buckle <laughs> up. Hey, man, it, it, it's not boasting when it's true. Um, it's just all facts. It's all factual, and we throw it out here as facts. I mean, uh, if somebody can uh, point out to where it's not absolutely the truth, <laughs> please put it in the comment section. Let us know. But we all are going to revel and appreciate what the University of Georgia has brought to the tight end position. Um, as I said, man, hey, listen, t- the University of Georgia has always been tight end you. I mean, this goes all the way back to um, I just lost his first name, but Mitchell. Uh, then we go to Larry Brown and Jermaine Wiggins. We go to yeah. myself and uh, my boy, Mr. Randy McMichael. I mean, Ben Watson. We talking about Leonard Pope. Now we're talking about guys like Big O and Mr. Best athlete in the nation, Brock Bowers. I mean, put make no mistake, the tight end position realistically has always been important, but you're starting to see a lot more athletic play coming out of that position. You know, um, a tight end can go anywhere from like Big O. I think Big O is 6'6", six, six, so 6'7", six, 265, 70 pounds. Brock Bowers is 6'3 and a half. I think he might be 240. So you can have tight ends that are <laughs> of all different shapes, sizes, um, athletic ability. What you see here in the I form, you'll see a tight end in what we call the inline position. And a lot of times, especially back in the day, this tight end, when he would line up like this, he wasn't expected to be a pass catcher. Now, these days, a tight end can line, a tight end can line up like this, or he can split out wide. And he can, put, he can catch the ball like a receiver and take it 65, 70 yards while a DB is um, kind of bucking it with the monkey on his back trying to catch it. I love what the tight end position is looking like these days. I love the athletes. Um, honestly, I have to tell you guys, these guys are way more athletic than I was coming uh, back in the day. Probably because, <clears throat> you know, I was a big guy too. But the way that these guys are playing the, playing the ball, catching the ball, um, I don't know if you guys saw Big O at the combine. This guy, 265, catching the ball with one hand, running a 4-6, awesome. doing drills, pushing the sled like, you know, he's a bully. Mm-hmm. This is what the NFL is looking for. These, This is what colleges are looking for. We yeah. just so happen to be a extremely um, attractive school. We do a lot with the tight end now, whereas some years before we had, kind of, you know, left some athletes on the sideline because we weren't using the tight end position as much. But the tight end position is great to be able to open up an offense because a lot of times if you have a dynamic running back, the defense is going to put another guy in the box. If you have a defensive, uh, I mean, uh, if you have a spectacular receiver or a couple of spectacular receivers on the outside, the defense is going to have to cater to them and leave the tight end one-on-one with the linebacker, which a lot of times he's going to be faster than or a safety that he's going to be bigger than. Either way, advantage to the offense. That's why the tight end is such a pivotal piece in the offense these days. And when you have a guy like Brock Bowers, big O, we're talking about Gelt, we're talking about Mr. Um, Mr. Lucky, who's um, a freshman this year, who's coming in. I'm looking for big things from these guys. He's going to continue to be the same exact 
recipe, I think, for our uh, offense, using the tight ends to free up and take advantage of mismatches. About, so with that said, oh, okay, I'll go ahead. Go ahead, Hina. I was going to say, how about Darnell Washington? You talk about some athleticism there when he leaped over that guy. Wow. In the Oregon game, that's right. Oh, yeah. He showed all that uh, athleticism. Which, which, which hurdle? Yeah. Which hurdle? <laughs> <laughs> that's 265 in the air. You got to uh, understand those knees hurt too. Yeah. You know, that's people uh, people don't really get uh, when you are that big going against a guy who – Darnell Washington is 6'7", 265, 270 pounds. That's right. Going against a guy Solid. who's 5'10", maybe 200, maybe 205. Mm -hmm. You do not want any of those problems. And a lot of times it's business decisions being made by those DBs. And sometimes those linebackers who want to continue to play in their college career or even in the NFL, hence the reason why you don't see them coming up and trying to lay the lumber to a guy like that. And a lot of times, you know, they might want to lay the lumber to a guy like Brock Bowers. But realistically, Brock Bowers is a 4-4-4-5 guy. You just don't expect for a tight end to be running that fast. And when he runs past you, a lot of those guys, you can see automatically catch a hammy. Or um, uh, like we say, they catch a fake injury uh, yeah, because fake they don't injury. want to be shown up by, <laughs> by getting ran away from by a tight end. That's right. Look at the stat guy checking in from the Fan Attic Football Show. He said the tight end game has changed a lot in the last 25 years where they used to be counted on big time blockers just a part of the offensive line now they're just matchup problems for the defense and he's still a little salty because oscar Dell was supposed to go to south carolina and he chose to come to athens sorry about that stat guy <laughs> All right, that's a great that's a great point stat guy I, i'll say this coach when i was coming out of high school um the size of a, the, the the size of a young man i was being 199 pounds <laughs> Playing, so trying to play tight end, soaking wet. So I mean, good. drenched, drenched, <laughs> drenched with batteries in my pocket. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't a guy who wanted to go to an Alabama who was three yards in a cloud of dust. And we had a coach um, by the name of Coach Dunn. And I can tell you, this was the first time I ever seen a revolutionary type of offense that featured a tight end. This gentleman came out of Marshall. Uh, when he got to UGA, he showed the showed us the offense. It was it featured two tight ends prominently. In the passing game, not just, you know, lining up in line, run, you know, running a um, lead, running a sweep and having a block all day. And that's the main reason why I chose the University of Georgia was because this guy had showed up, showed an offense that featured the tight ends catching the ball. And so those things are attractive. And that's why right now we got guilt. <laughs> we have Mr. Lucky. We yep. have these type of players that are coming in because they see now what the tight end position can be and what we're doing with the tight end and how we feature the tight end. So it's important. We're going to continue to get these type of guys, especially if we continue this type of production at that position. That's right. JV, uh, before we go on, don't not take us off a total road, uh, uh, off Might road. As well. but, but look, as JV said, Coach Dunn and laid the foundation for the two tight ends, and now we have evolved into, you know, tight end you. But I'm going to be honest, man. Like, listen, when I first got accepted to Georgia, I knew he was RBU. I came in as RBU. So when we got Jim Dunning, I told my boy, I said, Jim Dunning bringing all that Marshall down here, bringing all these tight ends. <laughs> I was right. going to be giving it to the running back. Like, what is we doing? <laughs> right. Yeah, Jermaine Wiggins followed him down here. I let this year follow them down here, but yeah. man, hey, listen, we we didn't tell you know I'd be hey man, I I had I had I had to, I had to stay in that offense. <laughs> uh, that was my J Jermaine Wiggins impression, by the way. Um, no, I mean seriously. So we got a question uh, from uh, Mr. Scuba Q. Say, what do you think the guy? What do you guys think the tight end could evolve into even more because it, it already ain't the same anymore? I just think. Uh, I mean, Brock Bowers is showing us. I mean, uh, the guy was a Kyle Pitts from Florida showed us. I mean, did Kyle yeah. Pitts ever line up in line beside the tackle? You know what I'm saying? It's almost like they didn't even have a tight so. end on the field. He was always mm -hmm. split wide. And Brock Bowers mm -hmm. did a lot of splitting wide. And that's why I think we're so so much of a matchup problem because he comes in, he may line up right beside the tackle, and then, you know, after a certain cadence, he may split out wide. Now they're like, who's going to cover this dude? Because like JV said, he's running a 4-4 four, four in the 40. He's, you know, big and physical, and it's like it's just a matchup problem. So I think we'll see a lot of tight ends. From the from the more elite teams, we'll see a lot of tight ends just lining up out at wide receiver. They'll be listed on paper as tight end, but they'll really just be another wide receiver. 
And to the point of evolving, though, Coach, I mean, realistically, I think we talked about this back on Respect the Hedges um, at the beginning of last season. When you have a guy who's 6'5", 265, and can run a 4'6", and you have a guy who's 6'3 and a half, 240 pounds, who runs a 4'4", you can do whatever you want to to that defense because they have no idea what you're going to line up in. They don't know if you're going to line up tight with those um, with those guys and have them blocking. They don't know if you're going to line up wide. You might put DBs on the on the field so that they can guard or so that they can defense, try to defense the speed in the passing game. But if you bring them in close, then they're at a disadvantage. If you put linebackers on those guys, guess what? Like I said, we have some five, fast linebackers, but everybody don't have linebackers running four five and four fours. You That's know, right. so it's going to be hard to even keep up with those guys in the passing game if you think they're going to line up tight. It's just a, a huge mismatch that we take advantage of very well uh, and we've taken advantage of very well with Todd Munkin at the helm. That's right. That's right. All right, man. We on to the... Oh, can we... I got a question. Absolutely. While we're on the tight end talk here and the importance of the tight end, JV, can you please explain to us or Shelby, uh, what is the weak side of the offense versus the strong side and why is it called that for our audience, please? Great question. Great shall question. We, no, shall we? Do you want to take it? Do you want? No, I'm gonna okay. go ahead. All right. That was a. I don't know. I'm gonna be honest. I don't know. So I want to know right. too. So let's look at the. Uh, let's look at the diagram we actually have up on the screen right now. You see the tight end is lined up on the defense's right. The defense's right side. The tight. The uh, offense's left side. Mm -hmm. But he's lined up outside of the tackle. Whatever side the tight end lines up on in this particular formation will be declared the strong side because we have an additional blocker and we have an additional man lined up on uh, outside of the center, um, which is denoted with the C on the, uh, on the diagram. The weak side would be the opposite side because we have one less guy on that side blocking, pass blocking, run blocking, what have you. Um, so it's, it's about the numbers, you know. Okay. Um, strong side is going to have essentially more people on that side. The weak side will have less individuals on that side. Yep. And when you're looking at, oh, I was about to say, when you're looking at any formation on offense, you start with the center. And like JV said, if there's more men to the left of the center, mm -hmm. normally that's the side that the tight end is going to be on. It's like, so whatever side has the most linemen per se, even though the tight end can actually go out and catch routes, make catch passes. So that's mm -hmm. how you kind of identify if you're watching it on TV. You find the center. You say, okay, there's two guys on the right, there's three guys on the left, then the left side is going to be a strong side because the tight end is going to most likely be that third person on the left side. What happens when you have two tight ends out on either side? Is there a strong and a weak side, or is it just – question. That's more of an even offense. Even exactly. So if you have two tight ends, um, you won't have a fullback. Here we have a fullback, but right. the, the second tight end most, uh, most likely – many times will replace the fullback position and then line up on the line. Mm -hmm. That's what we call an even, uh, even formation. So that forces the, uh, that forces the defense to declare a strong side. So they'll have a yes. strong side, but on the offense, we're more balanced. It gives you two receivers on the outside or, you know, if you don't have two receivers, we should gonna talk about what we currently have. So you check away the fullback, put the tight end on the line on the left-hand side. We have two tight ends, two receivers, um, and one running back. Uh, and I love that formation, actually. That's a formation that makes it extremely hard on the defense um, to double-team people. It makes it extremely hard on the defense to actually have uh, complete gap um, protection and integrity, too, because we have an equal number of blockers on both sides, and one of the defensive side is going to have to be a weak side for them, not for the offense. So, Love that offensive set. Great question. Uh, you know, what, where are the, all these questions coming from? Because you had a – that's a dope question. Yeah, I know, right? I, know. I really thought you were going to say the strong side was because, you know, it's the tight ends on that side and because the tight ends are the important person on the field. That's what I thought. <laughs> I mean, hey, listen, essentially, I, essentially, yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't I, – look, I, everybody knows. I'm going to drop all the flowers on a tight end because we normally get – nothing of dimensions, you know, but realistically, when you're dealing with, um, you know, the strong versus the weak, uh, of course, they put us on a field to um, essentially declare what side is going to be strong. So 
you can take what you want to from there. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, stat guys, adding on to where the tight end has evolved, uh, and I think he's got a good point. He says, I also think you're going to find teams doing a better job utilizing the tight end. That's called uh, peer pressure. They see Brock Bowers doing this thing. They see Darnell Washington doing it, and they're like, well, we need some of that. But Big Ten schools, like he's pointing out, Big Ten schools use it more like JV was talking about, that traditional, like, in line, right beside the tackle, use it as blocking. Wisconsin is a uh, – everybody I, – I, actually, everybody except for Ohio State pretty much uses the tight end in a traditional setting uh, where they block more than they catch the ball. But SEC uh, schools are bringing in these guys that JV mentioned, like the 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 six four two. 50 guys that can run really fast and catch the ball a lot more like what they would call a hybrid. They call them a hybrid because they can mm-hmm. block like a traditional tight end, but they can also catch like a wide receiver. So I think, uh, I think people are going to see, they won't, I think everybody wants them a Brock Bowers. <laughs> so I think they, they do will. now. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. Do. yeah. <laughs> For two years, they, they do now. Brock kill everybody. So uh, we got a question. Let's see. We got a comment. What's going on, Lance? Lance in the house. He said two tight end sets are becoming more common these days. That's right. Uh, that's a fact. That's a fact. We did it a lot, if not every play that we could when Darnell was on the field with Brock last year. It's because you Absolutely. can use both in the routes. Or it's a problem for it's a problem for matching up defensively because you don't know if they're gonna stay in and block or you don't know if they're gonna run out in a in a um in a route or not. And so that causes problems for the defense. But hey, man, way to cover the one more thing. One more thing before we leave the world of time. Coach, I'll buckle up. One more thing. Listen, (laughs) Coach, I, you know, I'm an advocate of putting as many tight ends on the field as possible. Literally, we we are almost past the days of even just the two tight end set because we have and run a three tight end set, and we could even run a four because we have that, that kind of athleticism at that position, which would totally destroy somebody's mental mindset and get somebody's defensive coordinator fired. That's, but that's not my problem. Point, <laughs> that, that's not that our problem. That is not our keep problem. On, Good point, keep on running this athleticism. That's right. Priest Pair checking in. Say, what's up, RTH crew just getting here? And, of course, JV's chatting up the tight ends. <laughs> what's up, PP? Yeah. Listen, and 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 just for your the the casual watchers, you might be watching the game with somebody, and then when we have a Brock Bowers in with Oscar Delp this year and Lucky on the field, that would be called thirteen personnel. The first mm-hmm. number refers to how many running backs you have on the field. The second number refers to how many tight ends you have on the field. So a lot of times when we have two tight ends on the field, we'll have one running back. So that's called twelve personnel. If it's three running backs. I mean, three tight ends and one running back, then it's 13 personnel. Just in case you hear somebody say, hey, why are we always running 12 personnel? Fat coach. Great, great point. So, all right, man. We done, listen, man. We done gave the tight ends flowers. So yes. now we go on to the guys that they normally help out. So when I was researching for the show, I had no idea who our offensive linemen were. Ooh. I had to look up their name. I had to look up their pictures. I had no idea. And when JV and I were talking, we were like, that's good because nobody's getting called out. That means they're working as a unit. It's the op- so I want to start with a bad offensive line first. Let's go back to the Tennessee game. Hooker was sacked six times. Georgia only gave up nine sacks all year. Just to put it in compare, you know, just to put it in perspective. We're just talking numbers. The, We're just talking, yeah, numbers. just talking numbers. I mean, that's a bad Good offensive game. line. You gave up six in one game. That's not good. That's how you get your defensive coordinator or your defensive line coach fired. Again, not my problem. But a good offensive line gives up nine all year. That was it. That was the fewest number of sacks given up in a 15-game season. That was incredible. That's why we don't know their names, because they just work. And they work together to make sure that Stetson Bennett is up, that Kendall Milson has a hole to run through, that everybody is doing their job. And that's why we don't know their names, but they are really good. We also had 616 points all year. Like, that's crazy. That's bananas. And that's why he went 15-0. and But again, if you want to look at a bad offensive line, go to the Tennessee game, rewatch that. Or you could just rewatch the highlights of the – of the sacks, sure. which I did, 
which is funny because when you have the um, audio with it and they're like, oh, down he goes again. It, it, it's hilarious. You can, um, <laughs> that is like, if, you, if you're having a bad day, go watch that. That will put a smile on your face. Oh, gosh. So <laughs> Shelby is all the way right. And the uh, offensive line always consists of five people. If you do not have five offensive linemen, you will get called for it. <laughs> you got two tackles, two guards, and a center every play on offense. So, hey, well, I like that, Shelby. You know, listen, not, always leave it to Shelby. We'll, hey, we can be petty all year long, baby. That's right. right. I love it. I love it. I mean, hey, Coach, let me I ask just, a quick question. I just, wanted to give you, okay. I just wanted to give you a bad comparison to a good comparison so that when you look and see, oh, that's why they're bad. That's right. Go ahead, JV. Well, actually, this is out to, I'm going to put this out to the panel. Uh, okay. Do we know what makes, what's the difference between a good guard and a good tackle? So, what makes a good guard a good guard? What makes a good tackle a good tackle? And are they interchangeable? Do you guys know before I take a stab at it? I'm gonna let you take a stab at it. Hannah, you want to say <laughs> okay? So as a coach, if I'm recruiting for college in a tackle, I'm looking for guys that have quicker feet that can pass block because they need to do what you call a kick step. You ever see the guys on the outside, their first step in pass protection, they take it, it, it goes like kind of slanted backwards. It's that's the kick step that they're talking about. Because they have to get in position to protect the quarterback. That's their main job. And 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 it's been like a emphasis since Lawrence Taylor uh hurt somebody out in the NFL. Joe like Thiesman. Kind of, Joe Thiesman, <laughs> that's right. So after that, they put a premium on the tackles, especially the left tackle, because most quarterbacks are predominantly right-handed. So their left side is their blind side, like the movie. Uh so and guards need to be able to. I mean, they need to be able to pass block as well, but they're looked at more for run blocking. So, like, when we got Tate Ratledge back, our run blocking kind of picked up because he's a, what they call a mauler. He just goes out there and just pushes people all over the place. So that's what I think of when we recruit. Like, when I look at our recruits, when I look at a tackle, I do want to know if he can run back, block, but I need to know if he can pass block. If our guards can run block and they kind of so-so on pass blocking, we can kind of hide them on the pass block as long as they can run block. And I'll attempt to answer the question, are they interchangeable? I would guess yes, because I remember <laughs> watching games and seeing them quickly flip on the line. So is that correct or no? They, so that actually is correct at times, yep. depending at times. on the job, athlete. Ain't it? You have to Depending be able, on the like, athlete. Yeah, exactly. Depend on the athlete. And sometimes we recruit a guy as a tackle, but then he'll come in and maybe the speed of the SEC is a little too much for him to pass block on a uh, at an elite level on a regular basis. And we'll move him in in line because he's super strong and he can, uh, you know, run block really good. That actually happened with Xavier Trust, who is our starting left guard. He came in as a tackle. And then, I mean, not for nothing, we got like a lot of five stars at tackle. People always say Georgia got all the five stars. If you want to find them, you can find them in the trenches on the offensive line and the defensive line. That's a fact. That's a fact. Great question, Hina. Good question. Good question. All right. Uh, Another question for uh, JV. What do you think the hardest type of offense is to defend? Uh, That's a question um, from Hina. (laughs) <laughs> that's a, that's a that's another great question. Um, question me personally, yeah. I think it's a qu- it's it's an offense that um has a balance of personnel. Um, yes. I'm not a fan of a of a five wide receiver run and shoot wide open offense because I think that opens you up, especially if you don't have a really good nucleus on the offensive line for a lot of pressure. Um, and you have to have some tremendous you got to have a tremendous quarterback number one to make some great decisions back there. If you have a more even offense, what you see right here, like we were talking about the I-form offense, I'm still a fan of offenses like this, a three wide receiver offense that has one running back, three, uh, uh, one running back, one tight end, three receivers. It gives you balance to be able to block, pass, um, and keep the defense off field, off, off, um, off track. I think that that is where, you know, we've been extremely successful I think that's what we've been asking for for, you know, these many years just to be able to be dynamic, but also have the personnel to pull off some of these sets. So if 
I'm going to just pick like a certain offense. I'm going to say it's a more balanced offense where you at least have a running back, a tight end, and two or three receivers in there. I totally agree. <laughs> All right. And you're going to uh, see that, that that's going to be mostly what you also see in the NFL, um, you know. Okay. Um, you'll hear all the time they throw around pro style offenses. Mm-hmm. So a pro style offense, a pro style offense doesn't always look the same. It has doesn't always have the same terminology, but it has it has similar nuances that are easily transferable from college to the pros. And so the NFL teams they appreciate players and guys that have come out of a pro style offense mm-hmm. because it's not. One of those, I say, lucky charm offenses that then you have to retrain someone how to read a defense, you know, how to recognize a, a you know, a, a four man front, a five man front, a bare front, um, cover two defenses. A pro style, off, oh, a pro style offense, when it attacks that in college, a guy can go to the NFL and have a better understanding almost off the bat on how to attack it in the NFL, too. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah, I think when I was reading a little bit about it, they were saying something, it said 1120 uh, personnel spread offense. And I believe that's what you were describing, you know, with, I guess, the fullback also being, you know, switching it and having a tight end in there. But they were, mm-hmm. they were talking about that formation being one of the toughest to defend for sure. And you hit on that very well. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. What a question. <laughs> All right, so JV, another question for you: If you could go back and play right now, any position on the on the offense, what would you play? Any position? Is there another position I would want to play? <laughs> See, I knew Sir, that was we the already answer. knew that was going to be the answer. <laughs> we knew let that was going to be the answer. I let me understand you this. Asking, let, but yeah, yeah. Let, let, let me let me let me let me let me understand you this. Um, I'm a six five. When I played, I was a 265-pound grown man, okay? I wasn't fast enough to play receiver. Make no mistake. Brought by, by, by far faster than your boy. But uh, I could get in line and block. I could get out, but I wanted to get on that outside, line up against a safety. And I wanted to big body this guy and make him feel it every time he had to tackle me. I love playing the tight end position. I, I, I was extremely resistant of playing it in high school until my coach said, well, you either play that or you play nothing. I was like, give me that tight end position, bro. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but it got me to where I was. And for me, I, I really appreciate, like I said, the nuances of the, uh, of the position because it allows for a lot of different versatility. And if you're a guy who can be versatile, you can be extremely successful. And so, yeah, if I had to go back and do it again, man, give me the tight end position. Minus the forty catches that Randy McMichael stole from me in my in, in my junior year, trying to play half that and getting all the special routes from his Black Quincy. <laughs> Shot said you, Randy. Shot said you, Randy. Yeah, that's fine. All right, let's see here. All right, we on that site. Uh, who is an eligible receiver? Mm. JB. All right. So eligible receivers in an offense, you're going to have what, what you see right here. Again, we're going to talk about the pro style uh, offense because we can we can break down a lot of different uh, alignments. But the easiest way to identify an eligible receiver, um, one, you have two wide receivers. One of these wide receivers is going to have to line up on the ball opposite the tight end. That makes him an eligible on the ball receiver. The other receiver is going to have to line up off of the ball that's on the same side as the tight end. If he were to line up on the ball, he would still be an eligible receiver, but the tight end would not be. That would cause him to be an ineligible receiver because he would be essentially what you call covered up. In this lineup that you see right here, the tight end, because the wide receiver on his side is lined up off of the ball, is an eligible receiver also. So now you have two eligible wide receivers. You have an eligible tight end that can be a receiver. And both running backs, because they're lined up off of the ball, can be considered as eligible receivers that would then come out of the backfield to be able to attempt to catch a pass. Um, at times you will hear announcements where um, a referee will say, 
okay, this offense alignment that is playing the, the tight end position that lines up in the tight end position is now an eligible receiver. That's mainly done because he has a lineman number on, and you have to at least give the the, the defense a heads up, so to speak, that this guy is in an alignment that would allow him to be able to catch a pass. If <clears throat> if he's covered up just like the tight end could be in this particular set, he wouldn't be able to go out for a pass. But because he's an eligible receiver, he will be an uncovered end of the line um, tight end or lineman. And both of those receivers or whoever will be on the outside of him will still be eligible. Uh, it, it gets kind of tricky because you really can't see the alignment from, t- from television. And a lot of the alignment um, – Announcements are made from the receivers to the referees that line up on their side. And the referees will then tell them, okay, hey, listen, you need to move back further so that you will be eligible and that the tight end so that the tight end will be eligible, or you need to move up on the ball if they're not on the ball or considered to be on the ball um, on that particular side. Yep. And when he says on the ball, for those that don't know, that just means standing on the line of scrimmage, like we have so eloquently diagrammed out here at the bottom. So that wide receiver on the left hand side of the screen is on the line of scrimmage and the wide receiver on the right hand is not on the line of scrimmage on the ball, off the ball. So anything to add, Shelby? No, that was good. I All enjoyed right. it. I'm listening. <laughs> All right, so the people that don't get their just due until they win a game for you or you yell at them because they didn't win a game, Ohio State, Ohio for State. you, uh, <laughs> the kickers and the punters. <laughs> so we talked about what are we going to say about the kickers and punters? Like you either do a good job or you don't. I mean, it is it is what it is. We looked at 2021 versus 2022. Our percentage was almost exactly the same. Um, 98.6% for uh, extra points, 83% field goals in 2022, 81% in 2021. I mean, we've got a great kicking team. That's what we do. If you want to look back on who didn't have a good kicking team, you can look at Ohio State. I mean, that was awkward. Um I mean, we loved it. Love it. Listen, I mean, <laughs> but I don't know why. 2023 is what we call him. Yeah. yeah. He's going you in know, the, He just doesn't I know also, he's going to get a spot in the ring of honor. <laughs> he is. And I also, I think I saw a picture of him walking home on 285. I don't know if that was true. That's just what I heard. Um, you could also go back to when Vandy had to find girls from the soccer team to kick Mm -hmm. because they didn't have enough boys again kudos to her but i'm gonna be honest with you has she tried to tackle somebody i was like lay her out you want to feel you gonna get hit no you might want to (laughs) run so again we have good i'm giving you comparison good and bad um yeah uh what we did against um again tennessee our punter I mean, you don't, you can't punt any better than that for it to hit at the one Mm -hmm. inch and go out of bounds. Like that you can't teach that. That's just a great punter. And again, that's what Georgia does. We get the best when you are the best, the best want to come. And that's what we have in our kicking team. And um, I know pod left to go to the NFL. I'm excited to see what he does. I don't see, I, I mean, who wouldn't take him? 98%. 98%. 98%. 98%. You, you can't get any better than that. That's facts. Facts. Hey, facts. Hey, uh, Kirby makes his kickers earn it. They normally come in uh, with no scholarship as a walk-on, even if they were the best kicker in the nation out of high school. And that that the, that uh, ideology has paid off for us uh, in dividends upon dividends upon dividends so right. far. So, uh Good explanation, Shelby. So we got a question from the stat guy about the formation here. He says, "Is the tight end if the tight end is lined up on the same side as the wide receiver on the line, he is covered up with the tackle on the other side with the wide receiver off the line be eligible." So in this example here, if this wide receiver over to the left, JV was lined up 
off the line, would the tackle on this side, the left side, now be eligible? Good uh, question, that guy. No, no. Um, the tackle would not be eligible, but that would be an illegal formation. <laughs> that would. Uh, that would <laughs> I was just yeah. about to say that, that. That would definitely be an illegal formation. You cannot have that many people in the backfield. <laughs> right. You and, and you must have at all times um, six people, or, or I'm sorry, seven people on the line of scrimmage in order for it to be an eligible play. So yes. if it's not, you don't have seven on the line, that's an illegal formation. Yes. So if that wide receiver were to take a step back, and we've gotten called for that. A lot of teams get called for that just because they don't – some wide receivers don't check with the referee. They just go out there, and the referee like, you ain't going to check with me. I'm just going to let you do it. And then they get an illegal uh, formation call because there's too many men in the backfield. And, and one more thing, though. Consequ- I mean, if you look at this same formation and you take the, the tight end and you line him up off of the ball, let's say he's almost at the same spot on the field, but he's lined up maybe a yard behind the tackle, and you move that receiver on his side up on the line, that's still – and that that is now a eligible play. Um, the tight end a lot of times will go in motion if he's lined up like that, uh, but he's still not covered up, if I'm not mistaken. He is now still an eligible receiver because he's lined up off of the ball, and that receiver on his side will be lined up on the ball. All right. All right, man. So we talked about kicker and punter, and uh, y'all want to go ahead and put y'all trivia up? Sure. Let's Hena, do it. did you have any other questions? Hena's coming oh. with the <laughs> Come on with the questions if you got them. I think I'm on the kicker punter part. No, I think I'm good there. I think I'm good. I guess um, explain to everyone how you can, um, on the field goal, instead of scoring one point, how can you score two? So the extra point is one. The for a two point conversion, the ball has to cross the plane, like a touchdown. Mm-hmm. You can throw it, you can run it, however you want to do it. The quarterback. But you put the sneak. offense on the field to to run that play. It's yeah, not a special team. Yeah, you don't you don't put don't put your kicker. I mean, you can. I mean, I mean, Georgia smart. Could. It's been done, right? I've seen Georgia it. could. Yeah. I mean, because they're just that good. I mean, we we could try it just to fake somebody out. Fake but them. I would do that against Vandy. Um, <laughs> not in a championship game. Got it. Yeah. yeah, I would do that against Vandy because Lord knows they can't stop nothing. That's right. <laughs> All right, so we uh, talked about all of these trivia questions except for two of them, but we can go yep. through them. Uh, how many linemen are there on the offense, Hina? How you many know? linemen are there on the offense? Uh, six linemen, five centers. Correct. Five. That's right. That's right. But that's how like, you do you it. Go. Hey, there that's you how go. you do it. When, I, when I'm center watching football, two, yeah. I look at the center. I go two here. I go two there. I'm like, he's a tight end because he's the third person on the line. That's how I do it. Yeah. So good, good job. Good job. All right. Uh, I'll take the next one. It says, how many sacks did UGA give up in 2022? We gave up nine. That is right. We gave up nine. I think that was best in the nation, matter of fact. Yeah. Actually, Thanks. yeah, yeah, I think that's best in the nation. That's so. the that's the record, fewest yeah, yeah. In, in a fifteen in game 15 season. Games. In a fifteen yeah. game season, correct, correct, correct. Who is UGA's all time leading receiver? That is Terrence. Terrence Edwards. Oh, Terrence Edwards, because he is yep. the last. Terrence Edwards. He's the last receiver that we had to go for a thousand yards in one season. Mm-hmm. That's a hey, that's a big deal right there. <laughs> and the All fact right. that he still holds that record, That's however right. many right. years later, That's is crazy. Right. All right. So anybody watching, do you know what Stetson's nickname, what was Stetson's nickname this past season? Man, come on. Yo, this is easy. <laughs> St- stat guy, you got to know this one because I know I told you a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, for those that don't know, anytime Stetson got his hair cut, he was Stet Quavius. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like right, before the, right before the, the game, when we saw him in the chair, we were like, oh, listen, 
When we so, was out in Cali and I saw that on uh, Twitter, I was like, he getting his hair cut? I was like, TCU don't stand a chance. <laughs> <laughs> they don't stand a chance. That was Ted Quavius right. in the game. That's right. Lance got it right. Lance says Ted Quavius. That's right. All right. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but just uh, it's, it's, it's something that people, some people know, some people don't. Uh, how many feet does a wide receiver need to have inbounds for a catch? Hina, do you know? Uh, one for college, two for NFL. There it is. There Just it right is. on the money. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and then Stat Guy has answered the last one. It says, who snaps the ball to the QB? That would be the center. That's yep. right. When we have one of the best, if not the best, in the nation in Van Pran, by the way. He yep. should be up for the best center award. That's our time, ladies and gentlemen. It's nine o'clock, just like that. Time flies when you're having fun, man. Uh, uh, Shelby, JB, y'all want to add anything to y'all offensive uh, show today? No, I think it was pretty obvious. Fifteen and zero. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Fifteen and zero. Yeah, I just want to say, man. Hey, listen, we got one of the most dynamic offenses in the country. No matter what anybody wants to talk about or say, back to back champions, uh, record number of points being scored. Uh, you know, just the number of athletes that we have. You talked about our our line. I mean, when you talk about a lineman who's just a straight baller, I was selling man, man, praying. He's a mall, absolute mauler. I love our offense, but listen. of all things that I love on our offense, listen, I love our tight end. Tight end. <laughs> See, listen. Somebody asked me if I thought we was going three feet. I was like, well, Bowers can't lead because he's just a junior now. I was right. like, get. Let me find out before if Van Pran is coming back or going to the NFL. When he said he was coming back, I said, chances are looking good. <laughs> yeah. Chances are Coach, looking good now that Van Pran is, is in the fold. <laughs> I'll take your good and I'll raise you great. Chances <laughs> are looking great. Plus, I looked it's at the uh, schedule last, next season. Yeah, I think. Hey, we'll hey listen, <laughs> we just we only can play that's, the people that, that's on the schedule. That's on the schedule. I mean, that, that's not, again, not my problem. I didn't we can't, we can't help it because the SEC said we can't play Oklahoma this year. That was not our call, people. But we just gonna line up and play whoever show up. And so, would it matter? Would it? <laughs> would it matter? I, I mean, not really. about Oklahoma. Respect. Oh. The that's, that's respect right. them. You gotta respect them. That's our show for today. Don't forget to tune in next Tuesday for me and Hina taking lead and talking defense that tries to stop these offensive guys. So for my panel people, Hina, Patel, Shelby, and my co-host, JV, this is Respect the Hedges. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. We are out of here. Go dogs. All right, go dogs. Go dogs.